Welcome to the Living Superfood Show. My name is Yumoya, and I'm here with my co-host, the one and only master chef, health and food scientist, Kidi Awadu. How are you doing today, sir? Uh, we black and we shine. What a joy. What a joy it is to be with you and continuing this series. Hopefully we're inspiring people to want to step up their nutritional game. Sounds good. So today we're going to be talking about nutritional yeast, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the first question I have, Keedy, is what is nutritional yeast and what does it look like? Okay. Nutritional yeast is one of several types of yeast that are used for the food industry. There's the baker's yeast, which is used for leavening bread. There's the brewer's yeast, which is um, used to brew beer. And then there is nutritional yeast. Now, in the case of the first two, those are active bacteria. So living bacteria, of course, it's not necessarily uh, harmful to the body. You know, the body has as many as 100 trillion bacterial cells within it that we live symbiotically with. So in this particular case, yeast are a type of fungi that exists fairly widely common throughout the world. And in the case of nutritional yeast, unlike baker's yeast and brewer's yeast, Nutritional yeast itself is not growing, or the other two are still alive. Okay, according to Bragg's nutritional yeast seasoning, it contains the following ingredients. Inactive dry yeast, pyrodoxine, hydrochloride, vitamin B6, thymine, hydrochloride, vitamin B1, I'm going to get through it, riboflavin, vitamin B2, folic acid, vitamin B9, and vitamin B12. What is inactive dry yeast and how is it made? Okay, when we're talking about inactive dry yeast, they're going to be using probably the same yeast stock that's used in baker's yeast, but in this particular case, it is actually, um, once cultivated, it's deactivated, it's heated, I'm sure it's pasteurized is the way that they kill the nutritional yeast. And then it's strained and then dried into the powdered form that people are accustomed to. And it does, during the course of this, like cheese, which cheese is actually a cultivated um, milk fat. And cheese is used, uh, cheese is made actually using bacteria from goat belly or from, yeah, sheep belly bacteria. I think it's goat belly that they use to make cheese. And so, like um, the nutritional yeast that we're accustomed to eating, the cheesy flavor really is made by the bacteria, the fermentation process. Okay. Uh, and of course, I, oh, sorry, when we talk ahead. about what's in it, you mentioned the different ingredients, and some of them were the chemical names, but it has a spectrum of B vitamins in it. And certain B vitamins, such as B6, B3, have very well known beneficial effects for people's health. Uh, vitamin B6 deficiency is uh, uh, equated to a disease called pellagra. Many people in Africa during famine periods may be living on a diet very heavily dependent upon maize or corn as we know it here. And what they find is that people who eat so much maize, they may eat it as their stable food all day long. They develop a vitamin B6 deficiency. And when you look at the symptoms of pellagra, vitamin B6 deficiency, it actually resembles the very symptoms that are being called full-blown AIDS in Africa. So that's one point of caution for people in those areas suffering from famine. If they don't get other sources of vitamin B6, in this case we're talking about they could get it from nutritional yeast or just get it from peanuts, which are fairly common, ground nuts, then they could be suffering from these symptoms that then might be misdiagnosed as a clinical case of AIDS. Hmm, Okay. Thank you for that information. So uh, you did mention some of the B vitamins. Uh, can you explain uh, what B12 is? Yeah, B12 is one of the class of B vitamins. And I'm, I'm just pulling this off the top of my head. So I try not to speak too in-depth on things that I really don't know so well. I know I've studied B12 over time. I do know that for most people, um, because B vitamins are not fat-soluble, 
or they, you know, I think they are fat soluble. For many people, they're not. If they're a vegetarian or vegan, they're not getting B vitamins, which have been manufactured by the gut bacteria in livestock. So the livestock, the bacteria in these ruminant animals, animals that are eating grains and grass, these ruminants, the bacteria in their gut actually produces the B vitamin B12. Again, we talked about the the ruminant goats, and that's the source where they get the culture to make cheese from as well. So there's there's a kind of a, a class uh, a class association here between the ruminants and things. But if people are not eating animals as feed, then it's generally advised that vegetarians and vegans supplement vitamin B12. It's not a supplement you need a whole lot of. I have I use vitamin B12, but I may only take it once, two, three, four times every quarter of a season or so, and it works really well for me. Also, you can get vitamin B12 in sea vegetables as well as a full spectrum of amino acids. Another thing they say, if you don't eat meat, where you're going to get your protein? Well, actually, the true question is not where you're going to get your protein because everything, every living thing is made of protein. The key is where you're going to get your essential amino acids. Now, in the case of vitamin of um, uh, nutritional yeast, it does contain a significant amino acid called glutamate or glutamic acid. And these are one of the 22 amino acids that we get through our food. Our body breaks the food down into these base amino acids and then reconstructs new protein-based cellular material and all kind of materials, enzymes and everything. Our body manufactures these out of amino acids. Okay, I, 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 I'm going to kind of veggie back. I know people say piggyback, but I'm going to kind of <laughs> veggie oh, back. You can say dovetail. That works really well. <laughs> all right, dovetail. Um, so some sources have said that plant-based diets lack B12 and it is necessary in a plant-based diet and the best source is in meat. Uh, from your research, is this true? It could be true, but then we, the, the, the statement is tricked when we use the word best source is meat. Because yes, you can get your vitamin B12 from eating meat. The problem about that is, is what else comes along with the meat. And when we look at the spectrum of known contaminants of meat, they can range anything anywhere from pesticides and residues from farming chemicals, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals used to boost the, um, the hormones used to boost the growth, the animal's growth and everything, antibiotics that are used because most livestock are produced in a, in a situation which causes them to have high levels of uh, pathogenic bacteria, so antibiotics are used throughout that process. And also, and this has come up recently in my studies reacting to what's happening in the world with the coronavirus panic, is that meat is absolutely written full of what is called viruses. And if we really look closely at what is the definition of a virus, and we look at the nation's meat supply, it's, it's amazing that the, the epidemiologists are not calling out the meat supply system as a harbor of most of the viruses that people are, are uh, 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 associated with or, or uh, uh, introduced to or suspect to on a daily basis. Meat is just full of viruses. We don't know if it's 5 million or 500 million per meat meal. But that, that's getting me into kind of a deep rabbit hole there. I don't know if we necessarily have time to explain to people what is a virus and why I say, and I'm not the only one to say this, that the meat supply is ridden with viruses. People may have been eating them every day all of their life. Why the big concern about an innocuous virus called coronavirus? Mm, okay. So some say that nutritional yeast contains MSG. Is this true? It contains the glutamic acid. The MSG monosodium glutamate is a derivative that contains glutamic acid as well. But to say that nutritional yeast contains 
MSG, I think, is a misnomer. Let's just say they both contain the glutamic acid, the amino acid, and of course the glutamic, uh, the MSG contains it in much, much higher quantity. But then again, we have to realize glutamic acid is fairly common throughout the food chain. Okay. Of course, things when you're fermenting things, you're obviously up grading the amount, the concentration of it. But MSG, which I believe, and I might be wrong on this, I think that MSG also begins as a fermentation process. It was developed in Japan in the early days of the Second World War. I think that MSG is also a process of fermentation, but I could be incorrect on that. Okay, well, I was actually going to, that kind of leads me into the next question, but I'll kind of rephrase it. And okay. just kind of get to the point. So is MSG in itself good or bad? So MSG from every indicator that we have about high quality nutrition, MSG is something that absolutely should be avoided. We do know that like artificial sugars, it can act as an excitotoxin in the brain when it gets into the blood that penetrates the blood-brain barrier. <clears throat> and excito Toxins. I mean, the name is descriptive. It excites and it's toxic and it's poisonous. So in general, the more MSG that you are consuming, it's going to trick the brain into wanting to consume even more, which is what the, how the Japanese developed it. They wanted something as a food additive that would encourage the soldiers during World War II to eat more. And so that's where MSG developed from. And uh, now we have it as fairly common throughout the food chain, especially much Asian food, fast food is produced with MSG in it. And in essence, you've probably heard the joke, I ate a Chinese food meal and I was hungry an hour later. Well, behind that joke is the presence of this excitotoxin, monosodium glutamate, MSG, that makes you crave and want to just keep eating and keep eating. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what can nutritional yeast be used for? Well, in the culinary world, um, I use nutritional yeast to make products such as I have a spicy cashew cheese. It's a really, really big hit. Instead of using animal fat, we just use soaked and drained raw cashews as a basis, to which I will add a number of different ingredients, including a couple of teaspoons or a couple of tablespoons of nutritional yeast. And when all is said and done, it tastes like a nacho dip that is actually vegan. Mm, sounds good. It's really quite tasty. And I do consider nutritional yeast as a source of B vitamins that makes for a good superfood, food-based healing system. Okay. So if, if someone's eating popcorn... Uh, they can actually maybe use nutritional yeast on that as well, maybe as a substitute instead of putting like butter or I do else. use nutritional yeast when I eat popcorn. Another great one to add to your popcorn, which is also a great source of superfood nutrition, is dulce flakes or some mm. sort of, a, or dulce flakes are probably the best source of a powdered seaweed or flaky, fl sea seaweed flakes. There's, there's a nice tastiness but it also adds a spectrum, a full spectrum amino acids that's absolutely good and healthy for you. It's also good for the thyroid gland as well, containing natural sea-based iodine. Okay. So we're pretty much almost out of time. Is there anything else you want to uh, say for the people? I do definitely want to say this. I'm not giving a, a cross-the-board blanket affirmation that nutritional yeast is for everybody. Again, it is a bacterial culture. And for people who have autoimmune disorders, hypersensitive immunity, or people who are suffering from some sort of immune deficiency, I would probably not recommend that they consume nutritional yeast. At least do your research before doing so. But uh, if a person is in pretty good health and their immune system is real strong, nutritional yeast is not going to be so bad for them. 
if it is, if you do have a reaction and you're a pretty healthy person, you should be able to judge whether you're having a reaction and to be able to isolate what is it that I ate that caused me to have an inflammatory response. And if someone is eating something like nutritional yeast and they're having an inflammatory response, if they notice after they eat it and they start sniffling within a few minutes, you're having an inflammatory response based upon a reaction to something you ate and it's best to isolate whatever it was that triggered that response and eliminate it. Okay. Is is where so where can people uh, reach reach you? They can go to living superfood.com where we say food is nature's most perfect medicine. And we're very, very clear about that idea. And further, I would say with Living Superfood where I have two recipes books there two recipes books there you will find that medicine has never tasted like this before i really appreciate what you're doing i salute all of those who are tuning into this series let's all get healthy and let's have a beautiful life sounds good well thank you Katie, for your time and thanks everyone for listening this is the living super show until next time take care